Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December edition of the Sustainable Leadership Presentation Series. The SLPS is a collaboration of eight Nebraska higher education and nonprofit partners, including Central Community College, the Student Environmental Action Coalition at Hastings College, Creighton University's Sustainable Creighton Program, Jocelyn Institute for Sustainable Communities, University of Nebraska at Omaha Sustainability, Metropolitan Community College, Environmental Studies Department at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and Nebraska Recycling Council. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Alexandra McCracken, Project Associate with the Jocelyn Institute for Sustainable Communities. And today we're very excited to be bringing you this month's panel of speakers discussing the importance of environmental thinking within the world of design. If you aren't familiar with the Jocelyn Institute, our mission is to promote an integrated approach to sustainability through education, public visioning, partnerships, and research. The work that we do primarily comes from an architectural and planning perspective, but is centered around the concept of sustainable design, which is often defined as promoting human systems in balance with our natural environment. Our presentation today is meant to highlight the need for conscious and innovative, de innovative design thinking as we aim to transform our current throwaway society into a more regenerative system that allows us to flourish both economically and environmentally. Today, I would like to welcome Sharon Kuska, Professor of Architecture and Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Programs at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Jennifer Johnson Jorgensen, Assistant Professor in the Department of Textiles, Merchandising and Fashion Design at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and Amy Dishman, an NCIDQ Certified and Lead Accredited Professional at BBH Architecture. Thank you for joining us, ladies, and we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Sharon, if you would like to get us started, we'll go ahead and switch over to you. Thank you. I'd like to share my screen to start. And is it being shared? Yes, it is, Sharon. OK, thank you. All right. Well, I was asked to give kind of an overview of where we've come from. And so I've looked at here the five waves of evolution. and. We're going to go through the five waves. And these. this is a chapter from a book that Cecil Stewart and I um, are working on the manuscript. Um, and so the presentation is backed by that kind of research and direction that we are looking at in a book that we will hopefully turn out in the near future on making sense of sensible making. So I'm gonna start out in the first wave. The first wave is industrialization. It's the mass making of tools and machines for efficiencies of production and labor. The industrial revolution changed our way of thinking it changed our way of making. Fewer things were made by hand, but instead were made by machines in larger scale factories, making reproducible things that saved, accommodated human energy, it made life easier with more freedoms, more choices, and larger, more dependable markets. We experimented with living with and adjacent to the machines and the new industries, often with great sacrifice to human life, health, and comfort. But we established the basis for global commerce, trade, and the economics of coordinated labor, industry, and productivity. The second wave unlimited luxury of consumption. This is a wave in which we learn to throw away goods, products, 
and habitats. We became entitled to everything and anything and anywhere at any time and at any cost. We even had the luxury of contemplation of beauty, aesthetics, and new cultural and social heritage, along with the opportunities for unlimited mobility. We proved the benefits and the characteristics of free market capitalism, and we learned to accept divisions in sociocultural life between those who could gain access to capital and resources and those who could not. We carried the social and economic discriminations into systemic networks of governance, public policies, and insecure segregated behaviors. We moved into the third wave with the invention of electronics and calculating machines, our tasks and products, our services and communications could be even more efficient, more segregated and labor free with electronic and cybernetic tools. Human health and life have been extended. Life expectancy for the US in 2021 was 78.99 years, a 0.08% in increase from 2020, which doesn't sound like much. But when you look at it, in 71 years of improved technology and learning. Global communications and instant interactions were enhanced. Western culture and values became pervasive. That's advantageous to some, threatening to others, and access denied to still others. The globalization markets and cultures became pervasive worldwide and largely of Western influence in process, style, and aesthetics. These images show a Japanese temple and Japan today. It's the influence of Western culture and values on Japanese architecture a Chinese suburb of Shanghai, and an image of Tianjin, where we can see that Western influence taking over the culture and the social values of the people. The fourth wave was an age of the dawning of realization of the limits to growth experimentation with new ecological and biological values. So new definition of mankind's relationship to the planet, new images from space of our, quote, beautiful blue marble, and early visions of our responsibilities to Earth. There was a greater appreciation of things with more permanence and longer uses. It was quality versus quantity. Quality refers to the characteristic or feature of something. Quantity refers to the numerical value of something. Some say to be successful, you have to have a quantity of quality. There was an emergence of the awareness of the imperatives of sustainability, three-legged stool of sustainability, 
environmental, social, and economic. Or some put it more plainly as planet, people, and profit. Yet others more recently have said, satisfying human needs, ensuring social justice, and respecting environmental limits. So needs, justice, and limits. These imperatives were universally accepted. At the Jocelyn Institute for Sustainable Communities, we added two more domains to the imperatives. We said there needs to be a domain for the technological advances, because that was what is changing our system today. It's what is making differences on how we treat the other domains. Our public policies also have a great impact. And the idea that all of the domains are interrelated and that each one, when it is affected, impacts the others to some degree. And so it is a holistic approach. And so this occurs in the fourth wave. Explorations of design choices and options for products, services, and even selected biosystems. The emergence of new interdisciplinary, interdependent ideas of processes, management, and governance might lead to greater stability and the sustainability of human organizations and earthly habitats. We had the choice between a plastic toothbrush and a bamboo toothbrush. We have choices. This wave has also made apparent the widening gulf between those populations who have and those who have not. The raw distinctions between the developed and the developing nations. The key difference, a country is deemed to be developing or developed mainly on the basis of economics, per capita income, industrialization, literacy rate, living standards, et cetera. A developed country has a highly developed e economy and advanced technological infrastructure relative to other less developed nations. So let's move into the fifth wave. A coming age of recovery, recycling, reuse, repair, and reduction. The challenges of reinvention, reformation of human systems, and questioning of old and new human values. The emergence of sustainable lifestyles and new intelligent technologies, new economic platforms, and renewed equitable and secure cultures. The potential for design for recovery from the coronavirus pandemic, resources conservation, avoidance of waste, reuse, enhanced permanence, appropriate technologies, carrying capacity and stable energy and infrastructure systems, and new community values like making sense of sensible making occurred or are occurring in this wave. We have choices in healthy modern lifestyles of limited throwaway consumption. It's an era of making things and places in a manner that will conserve the limited supply of natural resources. It's a conservation-based design that will be paramount and have great value within these contexts. Each successive generation in the first world nations since the beginning of the industrial revolution has been dazzled by the advertising and marketing media, seduced by the style of design and aesthetics, 
and benefited to a life of more leisure and less labor, to more goods and less meaning, to instant emotional gratification, to more credit and less wealth, to more objects of the American dream, to less happiness and the ability to enjoy the dream, and to more affluence and less respect from the citizens of the developing or so-called third world nations. All the while, the true costs of loss and degradation, especially to the environmental resources and to the transfer of those costs to successive future generations and to the systemic inequities and racism have been masked from the public conscience. It is this wave of thinking and modern designing that we must come to terms with. We must develop common values and understandings about the perils of life on our only planet and our sustainable future. We must develop a guiding theory of practice that will be enduring and will result in the conservation of the Earth's natural resources, while also leading to greater respect for the history and contemporary values of peaceful community cultures, diversity, social equity, with interdependent political participation for making of new appropriate technologies and balanced cost benefits for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon, for that vital information. It certainly sets the tone and uh, gives us a, a more general idea of sustainability in a broader sense. So thank you very much. Let's go ahead and move on to Jennifer. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Jennifer Johnson Jorgensen, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Textiles, Merchandising, and Fashion Design at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And the topic that we're talking about today is so near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm currently engaged in different research studies and research groups that are trying to identify how we can overcome current barriers toward a more sustainable future in the textiles, apparel, and retail industries. And it also has been so interesting to see how passionate our current students are about building more companies that have sustainability at its core. So I wanted to start off with just a few general thoughts that are serving as some of the barriers that we currently are facing in the textiles, apparel, and retail industries. One of the biggest barriers are the consumers themselves. Uh, we must change the current mindset about the fashion industry and how we consume overall in general. All right, so there are many different perceptions that are around the word fashion. So for example, a Typical perception is that fashion is found only on the East and West Coasts in urban areas, primarily in New York City and LA. Fashion is for only women. Fashion is what you see on the runway. And fashion is trivial and for people that want attention and it's a total waste of money. However, despite these perceptions, it is really interesting that the fashion industry accounts for 635 billion in direct revenues this year worldwide. So people are consuming and they are consuming fashion. Right. And then there are also different perceptions that surround where and how clothing is made, which is very interesting. A stereotype that exists is that the fashion industry is run by women. Manufacturing is only done in developing countries, sometimes by children in unsafe settings, which does happen. Um, but there's also a perception out there as well about the made in tag. So the tag that says where your garment is made. Some people believe that that tag demonstrates where that product is fully made, which is not typically true. So 
After spending time as a sourcing specialist and as a merchandiser and buyer, and now as an academic in the field, I also wanted to share just a little bit about what I think of when I hear the word fashion and think about fashion consumption. This is actually what I think about when I think about fashion. Um, the textiles, apparel, and retail industries must have raw materials in order to even create product. So if there are shortages of certain raw materials, which are, of course, our fibers, our entire supply chain is thrown off. So I'm constantly keeping an eye out for what's happening with farmers, ranchers, and other producers. So for example, is there a shortage of sheep shearers, which has actually been the case in the last couple of years? Where are the hides of cattle going after slaughter? Has the distribution systems for raw materials been impacted by COVID-19 or bad weather or any other type of disruption? And then also, is there waste at this stage of the supply chain that we can ultimately use? And so the same goes for crops and petroleum. Has there been too much rainfall or not enough rainfall this year? How will climate change continue to impact these resources? Are there other agricultural byproducts that are typically wasted that could be turned into fiber? So ultimately, there is this disconnect between what consumers in general think about fashion and what our big challenges are in the industry. So when it comes to waste, consumers tend to think about what they discard, or they tend to think about the waste that is happening in a manufacturing setting, really kind of overlooking all of the other stages of the supply chain. And so to further illustrate how consumers are disconnected to sustainability and some of the steps we're trying to take towards sustainability, consumer purchases continue to increase for apparel. The average consumer purchases 60% more clothing in 2014 than 2000. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a more recent statistic at this point, but prior to COVID, I'm sure that number was even higher. So this leads to, of course, more consumer waste and Consumers look in their closets and realize that they don't wear certain things anymore, or the fast fashion item that they purchase is falling apart, so they'll just go ahead and throw away those textiles. So not only is consumer waste a problem, we also have other environmental issues that are on our radar. According to the UN, the fashion industry alone contributes 8 to 10% of the world's carbon emissions and our industry consumes more energy than the aviation and shopping industries combined. So it's a lot. What is even more concerning is the amount of textile consumer waste. It is difficult to picture the equivalent of a garbage truck of apparel being burned or dumped in a landfill every second of every day. And we are seeing textiles in oceans. We are seeing mountains of textiles on land and it isn't getting any better. So at this point, Global textile waste equals 92 million tons per year. And so here's a graph to illustrate how textile waste is being managed in the US. We are seeing more textiles being recycled or combusted, but again, the majority of textile waste is ultimately being landfilled. So to combat some of this waste, there are initiatives to send secondhand clothing to developing countries. A lot of consumers love this idea as they feel that their clothing is helping someone else. However, it does sound a lot better than it actually is. A lot of secondhand apparel is imported to developing countries that can't actually be used as it's either damaged or it isn't practical. And of course, if you think about the transportation it takes to get products here to somewhere else, there's a lot involved with that as well. So, if it's damaged or not practical, guess where it goes? It goes in the landfill of those countries. The trade of secondhand apparel also hurts local businesses because why would people buy apparel at any price point if something could be received for a lot less? And a great example of how donated items can hurt the local economy was found with Tom's shoes. Tom's was so popular about 10 years ago and continues to be today, but when Tom's was getting started and when it was at its height, they had a buy one, get one initiative, meaning when you buy a pair of shoes in the US, 
Toms would donate a pair of shoes to communities in developing countries. And again, consumers in the US loved this idea and felt they were doing a great thing, but ultimately it hurt the local businesses in those regions. So going back to our discussion on landfilling, apparel is typically not biodegradable. It is also typically dyed, different colors achieved through different processes, and it typically is treated with chemicals that can seep into our soil and water supply. So often our apparel can outlive us, which is really scary to think about. So what do we do about this? Well, post-consumer textile waste is a huge concern, we have opportunities to cut down on waste at each stage of the supply chain. So pictured here is just a simplified model of a supply chain. And as I mentioned before, we can decrease waste at each one of these stages. However, it is impossible to instantly eliminate all waste at each supply stage. So we need to prioritize where to start. And based on the research work completed so far, it does look like starting at the beginning of the supply chain with the raw materials and the end with the consumer might be a good place to start. So the fashion industry as a whole needs to work more closely with raw material producers. A very large majority of time, sourcing specialists don't know where the raw materials are coming from. They're just looking at the right fabric for the design. However, it would be beneficial for people to help bridge that connection between raw material producers and industry professionals. And that is something that we're currently working on. Blockchain technologies are also helping to create a more transparent supply chain that will allow everyone to see where their apparel and other products are made. And then the second part of that first step is to educate the average consumer on textile and apparel waste and waste in general. And again, many consumers do not know how or where to discard their textiles. And we do have a significant infrastructure issue with this. Many cities in the US don't have proper textile recycling facilities. And a lot of textiles that are recycled by consumers aren't actually recycled in a way that can be reused in the way that we think it can. So we have seen an increase in upcycled apparel in recent years, meaning that consumers or typically small companies are taking discarded textiles and turning them into other products. It is great to see but upcycling isn't yet realistic for the mass market, and it may never be realistic for the mass market as it takes a ton of time and skill that consumers most likely won't pay for. Consumers also need to pay more attention to what they are purchasing. Consumers don't typically know how to inspect their garments for quality or care, and um, some really don't know how to care for their garments after purchase and keep them kind of at peak position at peak quality for a long period of time. And then of course, we have to talk about fast fashion briefly as well. Fast fashion has catapulted consumer waste for our industry. Fast fashion doesn't design and manufacture quality apparel as they generally focus on creating high trend apparel that will only be worn about three to five times. So one of my favorite assignments that I give students is to investigate the construction of a fast fashion item and then also look at the labels found in those garments. And every semester, students find that the construction is shoddy, including parts of the garment that are cut off grain, which leads to that awful shifting or twisting of the garment when it's worn, and even the use of fabric with unrealistic care requirements. So for example, one of my students bought a brought a top to class and she purchased it at Forever 21 for $3.25. And it was a dry clean only top. Consumers paying that little for a top will not be bringing it to a dry cleaner. So it ultimately will either be discarded or it will be ruined and then discarded. So an idealized goal would be to create fiber sheds in different parts of the United States and then across the world. And I say this is idealized because there are a lot of barriers that prevent us from creating a fiber shed system. But ultimately a fiber shed develops and sustains kind of a place-based fiber system. And we have a few fiber sheds that have popped up around the US, 
um, the one in California being the most successful one at this point. And we would like to do something similar in Nebraska. And again, there are many barriers from preventing us from doing this, but we're taking small steps toward it. And so this is what we are hoping to achieve. Of course, a circular economy, which I'm sure you're familiar with, will help our industry and all partners in the supply chain to cut down on waste. Um, there are so many opportunities for the fashion industry to do a better job, and we can work toward those ideas and goals through research technologies and, of course, increased communication with all of our supply chain partners. So ultimately, we must change the perceptions and behaviors that consumers have about the fashion industry and waste overall so that we can create a more sustainable future. And similarly, industry professionals need to balance making money with our global and environmental needs. So there is so much to think about, but luckily some steps are being taken and hopefully strides will be taken moving forward. So with that, I wanna thank you for inviting me to share some of the things we are working on in our department. And later during our Q&A session, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Jennifer Johnson Jorgensen so much. That is extremely sobering information. I think quality versus quantity is certainly a central concept to the zero waste revolution, but often overlooked by consumers. So very useful information. Thank you. Let's go ahead and move on to Amy Dishman. All right, I think you all can see my screen. <laughs> so I, uh, my focus is on uh, architecture and interior architecture in particular. Um, but again, it's same themes um, that everyone has kind of spoken about today. So a huge way to reduce waste in architecture and construction industry is focusing on embodied carbon. So what is that exactly? Um, embodied carbon, is not what most people think about when they think of carbon. Most of the time we're thinking about operational carbon. Operational carbon is the carbon that it takes to run things. So when we talk about solar, we talk about um, our boilers in use, burning coal, wind energy, all of that is operational carbon. But the embodied carbon is similar to what Jennifer was talking about. It's the harvesting of raw materials um, it's the production to the factory, the transportation from the factory to the job site. It's all of that total energy used in manufacturing, the manufacturing process for materials and buildings. Um, because designers uh, kind of don't necessarily think about this until recently, um, our embodied carbon is actually pretty extraordinarily high <laughs> for what we do, I would say that's probably of all manufacturing throughout a global scale. Um, together, the, these uh, embodied, carb embodied carbon and operational carbon are the building's total carbon footprint. And right now they account for about 11% of all human caused carbon emissions on the planet. Um, because designers focus on the embodied carbon part of it, through the specification of materials, we have the ability to reduce that footprint by simply selecting materials with a lower footprint. Together, um, similarly to how Jennifer spoke about, um, the construction industry is kind of a giant portion of global carbon emissions. So together, building operations and construction are responsible for 39% of carbon emissions in the entire world. 28% um, of that is operational carbon and 11% comes from embodied. So it is a huge chunk that we can make a big difference and big impact on. Reducing our embodied carbon footprint is one of the biggest impacts we can make actually to change our current climate trajectory. And according to Architecture 2030, without reducing this, we cannot meet the goals of the 2015 Climate Accord. Reducing and repurposing existing building materials is the single most effective method for reducing embodied carbon. Um, and fortunately for new construction, there are numerous no cost or low cost methods to lowering that footprint as well. Um, embodied carbon 
represents about 50% plus or minus, sometimes 49, sometimes 51 um, of a building's total carbon footprint. So it's a huge part of every new construction or every construction project. So what, how does that break down? Um, most of it is the structure, about 50% is the structure, 30% is the enclosure, what we call the building skin. So if you think of the building's facade, and then 20% is the interior. So interior walls, doors, carpeting, ceiling materials. It takes about 30 to 50 years for a building's operational energy consumption to equal the emissions generated to construct it. While operational carbon can be reduced over a building's lifetime by renovations to more efficient or passive systems, embodied carbon is locked into place at the time of construction and it actually grows with every renovation. So when we think of cyclical cycles of buildings, you know, ideally they're not designed like fast fashion. We don't use buildings for three years and then throw them away. We might use them for 50 years and unfortunately throw them away. Um, but really I need to keep things that last. And to do that, we have to kind of remodel and reinvent that building's use over and over again. But every single time we do that, we're inviting more embodied carbon into that project. So 3% of a building's um, interior finishes might be, or interior materials might be finishes and furniture. Those are the things that are most likely to get changed over the most often. And when we add those up, so say there's, you know, a renovation every 10 years, the, um, the amount of embodied carbon for the interior environment can actually exceed the structure of it and sometimes exceed structure and enclosure combined. We touch a building's um, kind of life multiple times through these cyclical renovations and um, it's, if we can design for adaptation, so, you know, really changing things so we're not designing systems to be so restrictive that we have to rip all the guts out again. Uh, we design with working um, existing materials as much as possible. If we divert our construction waste, which is also a humongous contributor to landfills, it's about 40% of landfill waste. These are all critical steps in reducing our embodied carbon in the waste and construction industries. So one way we can figure out what how to do this, you know, <laughs> that's, that's the big picture. Now, how the heck do we do this and approach it? Um, a lot of companies now are providing em environmental product declarations or EPDs for short. And these act like ingredient labels on food packaging and include life cycle assessments. So if we consider the global warming potential of each item, we can select materials that have smaller carbon footprints, reducing our overall embodied carbon footprint of the building. So if we think of these in scales, right, we wanna pick something with the lowest GWP. Now, what's that actually look like? <laughs> it's not the prettiest or easiest chart to look at, um, and they're not all created equal, unfortunately. There is no global standard. There's no US standard of how these are necessarily supposed to look. And so comparing them is often really difficult. Um, comparing from one manufacturer to another is substantially easier because they're gonna be laid out the same. So in this example, these are ceiling tiles. Um, the Optima panel is really high performing, but it's made in a traditional way. The Lyra is also high performing, but it's made with plant-based materials instead. And so just because it's used using plant-based, we do get a little bit lower global warming potential there. Now these are two walk-off carpets. Um, walk-off is the carpet that's in a vestibule, cleans all the dirt off of your shoes to help indoor air quality. Um, one is from Interface, the other is from Bentley. When we look at that, it's a lot harder to tell who has the better uh, GWP. So what do we want to look at? The first label is international testing. The second is EPA testing. So usually I look for the EPA testing because I'm in America. Um, we also want to look for the unit of measurement. We want to see if recycling or disposal is taken into account. And is the total given to you or do you have to add up the stages by yourself? 
We also want to look at the service life me measurement. So that's really important um, and often overlooked. We have a tile company that is saying they are the first zero carbon um, tile, but the service life is 60 years. And that's really not realistic. Um, if we think about cyclical re renovations, especially with tile and how you know tastes change, 60 years is really kind of stretching it if we think it's going to stay around that long. <laughs> We want to look at the method of testing used. Um, and when we add kind of all of these up, Bentley appears to be the lower GWP, even though Interface will tell you that they are all um, embodied carbon zero. And a lot of that is because of offsets rather than the product itself being made with better distribution systems or better raw material practices. When we take all of these together for everything we're putting in a building, which is a lot, <laughs> we get the life cycle assessment. And that's really the gold standard for measuring a building's embodied carbon footprint. Um, they kind of take each product, each assembly, add them up to the total, and they can be really great for setting up a baseline. A lot of folks right now are just trying to figure out what our baseline is. That's what we're doing at my firm. We're not necessarily trying to actively reduce them. We're trying to figure out at this point where are most of our projects landing, and then we can set realistic goals for reducing that. These targets can kind of help you set those operational goals as well, because you can kind of do a little um, competition, right? How can we lower our, our embodied and how can we also lower our operational footprint? There's a lot of uncertainty <laughs> into how much carbon can actually be sequestered with bio-based materials. A lot of carbon is stored in soil and root systems. And so depending on the harvest method that can be released rather than contained um, because of that disruption to the soil. But in general, bio-based materials can act as carbon sinks. So the way that they do that is the process of photosynthesis. So in that process, plants take atmospheric CO2, convert it into cell their cellular structures. And typically this carbon would be released back into the atmosphere when a plant decomposes. But if we use those fibers in a building material or a textile, uh, we can sequester that carbon, making our building and materials act like a carbon and capture storage method. A really good example is concrete versus wood. So one ton of traditional concrete equals one ton of embodied carbon. It's a one-to-one -one footprint there. But a one-ton tree locks in around 1.1 tons of carbon dioxide. So it actually has a negative embodied carbon footprint. Cork, linoleum, uh, timber wood, cladding, flooring, these are all things that you might already be uh, aware of as bio-based materials include, and then there's also bio-based resins and polymers that are readily available in the construction industry. But there are a few that I wanted to kind of highlight that are new and innovative and really interesting. Um, hempcrete is one that might sound really wacky and new, but it's actually been used since the Romans. Um, it lacks compression strength, so it can't really be a load-bearing wall, but it's fantastic as an insulator and it can be used as a thermal mass, which takes on heat from the sun and then releases it into the atmosphere to kind of help with operational carbon as well. It's a great alternative to masonry and it's soundproof. Um, in a, a world kind of threatened by deforestation, I've seen reports that are really alarming, especially about the Amazon rainforest. Um, seaweed can be a really cheap self-replicating alternative to wood if it's used properly. Um, it's also non-toxic, it's fireproof, and it has 150 plus year life expectancy and again, superior insulating values. Um, the seaweed pillows that are pictured were used as cladding on uh, homes in Leso, Denmark. It's a century old building material for the region and they're kind of picking it back up again. And then lastly, um, this bolt threads is actually a mushroom leather. It's made from mycelium, which are the root structure of mushrooms. It's also the network in which trees talk to each other and it's super fascinating just on its own. Um, it can be rapidly uh, and intelligently grown into various characteristics for strength, texture, resilience. 
They have exceptional strength, heat resistance, and great insulators, again, completely biodegradable, completely comp compostable, which most products aren't. And it can be grown into specific forms. So you might see it in packaging instead of the foam cubes. Right now, some people are experimenting with mycelium packaging, but it could also be used to make bricks, compo composite board, because you can press it in under really high um, weight. And then it kind of makes like, a particle board type substance. Um, and if you press it even more uh, under the right circumstances, you can make leather out of it. We know nothing lasts forever. <laughs> so a great way to kind of build out waste or design waste out is to design for deconstruction. We know we'll have inev inevitable changes. We know most things will ugly out before it wears out, particularly carpet. It will, it will never wear out, <laughs> it'll really just get ugly and then we'll get sick of it. Um, so if we design for these renovations and we design to make things more easily reused, that's really the best way that we can kind of approach this issue. Again, we wanna employ circular economy principles. Uh, we wanna think of buildings as quality material stock rather than heaps for the landfill. We need to favor screws over glue. If it's screwed in, it can be taken apart. If it's glued, usually it can't be and that gets sent to the landfill. We can select materials that are diverted. So um, textiles in carpeting can all be diverted and recycled and reused infinitely. Um, it's actually one of, a, one of those really great examples of a completely closed loop that's possible, but most of it unfortunately isn't diverted. And we can use um, things to repair or refinish, replace, rather than kind of taking everything out. We can also select pallets that adapt and specify salvaged, refurbished, or remanufactured products rather than virgin. This chart is a really handy example of thinking of the different layers that come to a building. So we want our structure to kind of be designed for deconstruction, but we also want it to last 60 to 200 years. Um, the next part is our skin or that envelope. We'd rather design that for refurbishment. Uh, we wanna think of our services such as mechanical and electrical to be a loose fit. So I have a example where I turned an old gym into an office building that was not a loose fit. Those are two extremely different things and all the mechanical systems had to be taken out and replaced because they just weren't compatible for those types of activities. Um, we wanna think of space as being designed for flexibility and adaptability. So possibly using demountable walls rather than typical construction walls. So we can reorganize our footprint and layout within the building. And then thinking about that the stuff, I keep uh, asking all of my manufacturers to start thinking of the sharing economy in the furniture world. Um, people are constantly buying furniture right now. They keep it for about five years and then what happens to it? It gets landfilled. It usually doesn't get resold or repurposed or remade. Uh, so that's a wonderful opportunity to expand the sharing economy that you think of with Airbnbs. I wanted to share a really good project example so folks could see this in action in, in real life. Um, Burner Cot is really well known for their sustainable work as a firm. And they took an approach to the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art as an embodied carbon challenge for their team. So this is located on a 20 building industrial campus. It was converted from factories into a museum. They have a 25 year master plan, which is a huge long master plan. Um, and the existing factory structure was kind of already a bonus because the lowest embodied carbon building is one that already exists. So another huge reason to save our buildings that are already here. Um, so they wanted to look at what innovative materials they could use for construction and remodeling to keep their embodied carbon as low as possible. And what they did was they decided that they would use no virgin materials on the project at all, other than the drywall that they used as kind of a museum within a museum. So the team reshaped existing building with cut and fill approach using 
the actual building as a material bank. So where they had made new openings, those bricks were salvaged to be used to close old openings. You can kind of see that example in that archway picture. Um, all the stone, uh, all the wood flooring, all the brick was all salvaged and reused from the building itself. They used embodied carbon as a key strategy in their project. And not only does it retain its original character, it allows for that museum within a museum approach that allows for collaboration with artists, foundations, collections. It also lowers the operational carbon of it because they can kind of have a tight fit for those museum spaces and a looser kind of more open fit that allows for humidity, allows for daylight and the other structures. And so together they kind of reduce the carbon level levels on both sides of embodied and operational carbon. And it's a really beautiful and unique example of a project that's very successful in the end. So the task is overwhelming, <laughs> we know that. Um, designers are, can often be frustrated because we're usually left out of operational discussions. I'm not necessarily in all of the meetings with mechanical systems. I might get the impression that I don't have much influence over reducing our project's impact if I only focus on operational carbon. But if I apply those circular design principles to my project, um, I know embodied carbon can have a huge opportunity and power and impact to help both our built and natural environment. So if I consider you know, things for second life, things for the end of life or their future use when I design, I can design for deconstruction, repair and replacement, and I can span those efforts into the future. We want to focus on, again, specifying products with that low global warming potential and using bio-based materials and diverting our waste, which is a huge, huge category to that. So with all those tools in mind, we can really prioritize the carbon, but also the waste in our projects. I can share resources. So I have a couple slides that we can share out and will be part of the video that Ali's doing, um, where you can get re really great resources into how you can actually implement this and learn more about it. Um, the new South Wales University has done an amazing job of giving numerous resources for reducing carbon, both in the professional setting, but also at home. So you can take it home and apply those tools to your own work and your own life. So with that, I'll give it back to Alex and we'll, I'll stop my share and we'll answer some questions if you have any. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy, for that uh, in-depth presentation. I think uh, whether you're a designer or a consumer, having a working knowledge of that info is extremely valuable once again. So we will go ahead and open it up for question and answer. I think we have Carolyn uh, with the Jocelyn Institute as well. Um, do we have any in the chat box, Carolyn? Yes, we do. Sorry, the sun coming in probably can't see me very well, but I will go ahead and read some of those. Um, so Diane is asking, and I think this is for Jennifer, is there consciousness in the fashion industry about water requirements for various textile fibers, about dye substrates, about petroleum products, and our fashion designers being mindful about the circular economy? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say there is quite a bit of thought that a lot of designers and companies are putting into creating a more sustainable product and a more sustainable supply chain. But overall, I think it still comes down to the money that needs to be made for that company. And so, that kind of trumps everything else where, yes, sustainability is important. They know it's important. And if their consumer isn't specifically saying we have to have sustainable products, then a lot of times it will just be not necessarily ignored, but just kind of put to the side and they'll say, oh, another day. <laughs> we'll tackle this another day. So it's definitely in people's minds in the industry, but we still don't quite know how to operationalize all of that. Um, and then in terms of the circular economy, it's the same thing. I mean, we would all love to work toward a more, 
more sustainable economy, a more circular economy. And it's just, how can we do that? How can we make that happen that's standing in the way? I'll add that in commercial settings for carpet in particular, um, companies are really, really trying to focus on less water use and leaving water cleaner than when they got it and fewer dye um, substances. But I will say it is a tiny market of textiles. It's, I think, less than 2%. So they're trying, but it's not going to make a huge dip difference or impact, unfortunately. Um, and I was wondering for um, Jennifer, I know you said there's not a lot of movement being made in these regards. Are there just any companies that stand out to you as um, kind of being more conscien conscientious about this? Um, or is it mostly um, same across the board that companies aren't really um, doing this? Well, companies are definitely trying, <laughs> but again, it's just such small steps. Um, but there is a company that I absolutely love. Um, it's called Volback, and I believe it's spelled V-O-L-L-E-B-A-K. And I might be wrong with that spelling, um, but it's a really interesting company that works a lot with R&D. They're just focusing on new fibers and just new designs and trying to figure out how they can get the two to mesh to a point where consumers will actually want those items. And one of their key products right now is a t-shirt made out of algae. And it is something you can bury in your backyard. And you know, it's just a, a great step, I think, toward getting consumers to think in that way. So definitely a great company. And I'll quickly check the spelling of that and stick it in the chat for you as well. But that's a great company to kind of keep an eye on because they're really doing some interesting things. Thing I've been yeah trying to keep that on my radar with the more um, environmentally conscious companies. So thank you. Um, let's see, Diane put in the chat, um, Design for deconstruction seems to be a critically important concept. How prevalent is this approach among building designers slash contractors? And to what extent are manufacturers of building materials being mindful of carbon sequestration? Extended producers' responsibility is becoming more important among carpet and paint manufacturers. But is the same thing true of other designers, manufacturers of other building materials? So that is probably for Amy. Do you have? Um, anything to add to that, Amy? Yeah, I would say in our area, designing for deconstruction is more difficult than it should be. Um, in other places around the country, we have contractors begging architects to design for deconstruction. They want to divert their waste. It's cheaper for them to do that. Here, it's more expensive because they need to hire folks that actually think and take time and what they're doing when they demolish. So it's more of a challenge here, <laughs> um, but people are starting to think about it more. Um, there are ways that a lot of, right now, a lot of it is quantity makes it possible. So particularly with carpet, even though nearly all of them in the commercial setting are designed cradle to cradle. They can all be sent back and reused and remanufactured. You still have to have a big enough qual quantity to send it back to make it worth the shipping and transportation in the company's mind. So that's a hurdle. And there's also not anything in place for waste that happens during construction. So we know when things get installed, there's always a percentage of waste. Right now, there's nothing to do with that which is frustrating, I keep poking at that. <laughs> um, and then for materials that people are actually thinking of, it's actually kind of exploding in the interiors world. Um, I think it's less so for architectural materials, but those are often more easily kind of reused anyway. Brick and stone can be reused over and over again. Concrete is readily recycled already. Um, steel is infinitely recyclable. So now people are really thinking of embodied carbon with tile, with carpet, with ceilings, 
those kinds of materials. But at the same time, it's sort of when folks started thinking of recycling, we're getting some greenwashing and a lot of promises made that you can't necessarily verify um, and often leave me with more questions and answers <laughs> when they kind of bring them up. Um, and I think that there is a movement, especially for firms that have signed on to the 2030 challenge of designing for deconstruction and really thinking about these steps um, along the way as they design, you know, step by step, let's use Tally or let's use other kind of software that breaks this all down and sees where our impact is and where we can make the most difference in our projects. I hope that kind of answered it. <laughs> yeah, and this kind of goes along with that and you might have touched on it a little bit, but um, I was wondering, so you talked about those materials that are more carbon emission friendly and deconstruction, obviously. So does that have to be a request of the client that you're working with today to make that happen or is that the firm tries to implement those or who's kind of controlling that demand? Yeah, that's a great question actually, because um, in operational carbon, it usually is a request of the client, right? We want PV panels on the roof. And so you get really, you know, kind of hamstrung with that. But for operational, we usually don't ask, we just kind of do it, <laughs> which is kind of a huge benefit to it. Um, so really good examples, concrete, we can put more fly ash in that just by changing our spec, which dramatically reduces the embodied carbon in that, but the client would never even know that it happened. And it's often cheaper too. So that will come up in value engineering discussions of how can we change the composition? And we're like, we're all for it, let's do it. So it's actually one of those things that you don't necessarily have to talk to the client because they won't see it. Um, we can kind of compare products that are equally going to perform, equally beautiful, um, equally durable, and kind of take all those parts out of it, make, you know, make those selections ahead of time, and then look at the embodied carbon and say, this is the one that we think you should use without them ever even knowing, <laughs> which is kind of sneaky, but you know, it's half of a project, so it's kind of a great way to approach it. Um, I would love for a client to come to me and say, this is our goal, but I haven't had it for embodied carbon yet. Okay, that's cool that you guys can kind of build out a little bit in the field. Um, let's see. Diane, I asked, and this is for Sharon, can you talk about the increasing use of cross laminated lumber and how does that help in terms of carbon sequestration? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, cross laminated timber is um, made of all wood. And so therefore the panels are like a carbon sink. And as such, um, they keep the carbon from entering the atmosphere. And so, yes, it's a uh, stores more of the carbon than many of your traditional because of the, its manufactured direction. But um, it's, it can prove to have a negative carbon footprint. So yes. Great, and then um, Diane also asked, are there any efforts you know of to make concrete more environmentally responsible? I think Amy touched on this a little bit. Um, does anybody have anything to add to what Amy's already shared? I think we're trying. I mean, a lot of it gets recycled on a job, but it's just unfortunately one of the worst <laughs> ones out there. And you need it. Very true. Um, okay, I think those are all the questions I'm seeing in the chat. Um, unless anybody else has anything last minute. But if not, I'll turn it back over to Allie. Yeah, okay, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much again. A special thank to our thank you to our speakers. Super interesting information. I'm sure everyone loved it. And also thank you for tuning in and everyone's continued support. As a reminder, you'll be able to access this and past episodes of SLPS on their YouTube channel, the Sustainable Leadership Presentation Series. So 
we hope that you will consider sharing on your social media platforms. Thanks so much, everyone.